Hello, I'm Ted Lavera, the original business buyer advocate. I'm not a business broker, never have been. You're going to hear a conversation between me and a business broker I've known since 2005. He's going to share with us some of the pitfalls and opportunities that buyers and sellers face. And he's going to show us some of the best practices for deal making. But first, let's introduce ourselves. So, uh, Lauren, who are you? Why should we be listening to you? Well, I'll be glad to explain that, Ted. Will you do the same? <laughs> okay. You want me to go first? Oh, no. You go first. Okay, I'll go first. Uh, for the last 37 years, Ted, I've been a business broker. And prior to that, I was a business consultant. And currently, I represent M&A companies and Main Street businesses. That's your story? That's my story. I'm sticking to it. <laughs> okay, here's who I am. Some of you might know me, but just in case you forgot, for more than 30 years, over 100,000 people have bought my books or attended a seminar, or some of them have been clients, and we've worked on things like creative financing, buy-sell transactions, I think the interesting part of this is I've trained 298 professionals. They don't work for me. They're not connected to me in any way to better serve business buyers. And, and of those 298, about 50 of them were business brokers. They just wanted to do better. And one of the reasons we're talking to Lauren is I've been watching what he says and does for a long time. I like what I see. And that leads me into a question, Lauren. What have been some of the highlights and well, low lights when you've worked for buyers and sellers and start with sellers, but be sure to cover the buyers. So in other words, what I want to hear, are, are what were the, let's say the behaviors and circumstances that, that, that pushed people away from the deal making table or brought them together? Well, I'll put it into four categories. Uh, best experiences, worst experience for sellers, same thing for buyers. So let's start with sellers. My seller high point was working with two brothers who were making $2 million profit, which is extraordinary. And they wanted $11 million for their company. Needless to say, every buyer said it was overpriced. But ultimately, I did find two buyers that were willing to pay the $11 million and that's what we call in mergers and acquisitions a 5.5 multiple, which is very, very rare. So that would be my seller highlight. My seller low light would be working with a company where they, in essence, wanted to sell their business uh, for a certain price. And we were never able to get it but the company was a electrical, commercial electrical company. He was my neighbor and he came to me and said, help me sell my business. Well, within three months, we had an offer. He declined it six years later, six years later, he had another offer, he accepted, it was less than the original offer in the first six months. So really? that would be the seller low light. Now, with the buyer highlight, I had a corporate executive come to me and he said, Lauren, I've got three children under the age of four and two of them are twins. And I travel for the company over four days a week. I'm not getting the opportunity to see my kids grow up. I need a business close to home so that I can come into the home, say hello to my wife, play with the kids. <laughs> And in essence, we found him a technology company, and he did so well that it's a multi-million dollar company with over 10 employees. So that would be the buyer highlight. The buyer low light was a gentleman, another corporate executive who came to me, and he said, I have a skill set, Lauren. I know what I'm capable of doing. Let's go find me a company. Well, within two months, we found a business that had 80% of what he was looking for. I said, you need to buy this because you have enough skills. 
you can fill in the missing 20%. He said to me, no, 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 Lauren, if we found something this good, this quick, imagine what we'll find if we keep looking. <laughs> well, needless to say, four years later, he still had not purchased a company. So that was, you know, the buyer low life. Oh my God. Okay. I, I have to try to 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 tell you a story that fits into those two situations. One of the guys that I trained oh about 15 years ago, maybe about 10 years ago, he was a, he was already a professional advisor. He wanted to learn how to better serve buyers. He did he did not want to be a business broker. He just basically wanted to work for buyers and get involved in creative financing and other things. He got approached by a lawyer. And the lawyer was representing a seller who had an offer for $12 million from a buyer to buy the seller's company. So the lawyer calls my guy and says, hey, look, you work for buyers. Does that $12 million seem reasonable given this seller's company? My guy said to the lawyer, absolutely not. This is way too low. So the lawyer said, well, what do you think the seller needs to do to get a higher price? And we said, well, are you, are you prepared maybe to lose this offer? Because what we're going to suggest could cause the buyer to walk. And the lawyer said, well, you just tell me what you have in mind, and I'll ask my client what he wants to do. We said, remember, we're buyer advisors, so we don't like this, but we're getting paid to answer this. It, we said, create buyer competition. The seller contacted us and said, what do I have to do to sell my company for more? We said or at least my guy said, agree to pay me 20% of anything over 12 million. And if we can't get you more than 12, well, you'll sell it to the person who has the open offer on the table. It took us about 10 days. The company sold for 18 million. Mm. Guess, wait a second. Guess who it sold to? The guy who offered 12 million. <laughs> it was a corporate buyer. So folks, you're not going to hear me say this too often, but the magic of business brokers is they can create buyer competition. To us, that's not the best day. But if you're a seller, keep that in mind. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. That's that's me pitching the brokerage trade, folks. <laughs> okay. How about another question? Um, let me think about this one. Well, okay. How do you help buyers and sellers avoid self-defeating behavior? You know, shooting shooting themselves in the foot. Well, I have two rules that I follow, Ted. Rule number one, never lie, whether it's to a seller or a buyer. Uh, by not lying, you build trust and confidence. Rule number two, never insult a person's intelligence. And by doing that, you gain respect. And that's what I advise my sellers and my buyers to do. This week, I got a, a newsletter from a business broker. And it opened with, buyers don't try to tell the seller their business is ugly. It's like saying their baby is ugly. Mm -hmm. And the newsletter revolved around how buyers could have a more gentle hand to keep owners talking to them. Okay, what about some of the lessons you've learned from what we've talked about already? Well, the lessons that I've learned is when a seller wants to sell their business, if they have a skeleton in the closet, they need to disclose it immediately. Because if the buyer can't accept or tolerate it, it saves everybody time and money. And that's the key. There's no reason for a buyer to spend thousands of dollars, thousands of hours, find the skeleton and say, I'm out. You don't want to wait till due diligence. So that's one thing. With regard to the seller, I think the seller has to be totally prepared. And what I mean by totally prepared from A to Z, things you wouldn't think are obvious, it needs to be addressed. I, I kiddingly say to people, when the buyer drives up to your business, are there potholes in the driveway or are the bushes dead by the building? Well, again, it's subtle, but it's meaningful. They're gonna think, well, if it's like this way on the exterior, how's it gonna be on the interior? 
So that's what I mean. Buyers need to cut their losses early. Sellers need to disclose the skeleton and make sure everything is perfect. One thing that I did, Ted, I put together a list and I wrote an article like you met, you write many articles. It basically goes A to Z, tells a seller what they need to do to be ready for a buyer. You know, it goes on the other way too. There are a lot of buyers. Well, let's not even call them buyer. Nobody's a buyer until they buy a business. What they actually are are searchers. And they're out there wandering the streets. Most of them don't have a clue. Some of them don't have enough money. And one of the things sellers and their representative needs to do is force the so-called buyer to show the money. Not say they have it, show it. If they can't show it, dump them. This mm -hmm. is so important because otherwise, guess what? You the owners risk revealing, well, maybe trade secrets, definitely sensitive and confidential information to somebody who's not going to qualify to do the deal. So get the money handled upfront, first conversation. I totally agree with you, Ted. In fact, whenever I'm working with a seller, there's a couple of things that I require. Every buyer has to complete a non-disclosure agreement and every buyer has to prove they have the cash or a banker's letter saying that a loan can be made in this amount if they purchase a company of this amount. Yeah, this stuff is too serious and too risky to be you, you know, playing around. Lauren, based on what we've been talking about in your experience, can you give a, a tipper or an action that, that you think people ought to keep in mind when they're trying to make worthwhile deals? Yeah, I I think, again, honesty is the best policy. Total transparency goes a very long way for, as I mentioned earlier, to build confidence and trust and respect. So it's simple, but it's very, very important. Anything else? Well, I think, as I mentioned again, adequate preparation on the part of buyers, which you know completely, and on the part of sellers, which I know completely. Well, what about advisors? I mean, well, you're, you're, you're bringing people together, some of which don't have a clue. <laughs> right. Well, I suggest that the seller have their own professional advisors, CPA, attorney, and they're prepared for when they meet a buyer. Now, buyers, I feel, need to take the team approach. And what I mean by team approach, a buyer as an individual can't possibly evaluate a business opportunity. So they're going to need experts like CPA, attorney, financial analyst, marketing person, environmental engineer. These are the people that the buyer needs because the buyer needs the opinion that, okay, go ahead. It, it basically checks off all the boxes. You know, one of the things that, that that I beg my clients to do, remember I work for buyers, buyers only, is to find out who the top industry consultants are in whatever sectors they're targeting. And we contact those people and we say, we're looking for businesses in this sector. We see you're a leading consultant to those kind of companies. If we need help and due diligence, can we call on you? We'll pay you, but can we call on you? That really helps us with owners and brokers because they realize that we're going to do what needs to be done to really understand the industry. And we also tell the broker and the seller, we're going to keep this consultant on retainer when we go into the transition period because the owner can't stay with us forever. So the owner might only be there a month or two, but know that we're, we've already identified an industry expert who won't work in the company, but it'll help us work on the company. And they love it. Brokers and sellers love that approach. What do you think? I think it's outstanding. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What's happening on the horizon? What do you see down the road, let's say in the next year or so, for buyers and sellers? Sure. Well, what I know is with COVID, many companies had employees work remotely instead of in the brick and mortar office building. And what I suspect is when those employees are operating from their homes and they see how easy it is to 
conduct their work, that some of them might decide, maybe I need to become an entrepreneur. And if I become an entrepreneur, what things might I be interested in? Well, I think the opportunities now in e-commerce are very, very desirable because this is a 24-7, 365 business. And I kiddingly say, you can be in your pajamas, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> it's, it's continuing to roll on and it's very desirable to buyers. What I've discovered recently, one of uh, my prospective clients was looking at only e-commerce companies and was willing to pay a multiple of five when typically you're looking at a multiple of three, 3.5. So these employees do want to become entrepreneurs. Well, from the buyer view, when I get contacted by somebody looking at e-commerce or anything related to that, I say, be aware that if you're not careful, you will overpay and you better analyze the sustainable, sustainable competitive advantages because it's a highly competitive company or industry or sector, let's say online type businesses. So you got to get it right. You got to get it right. And the good news is the, the, the business brokers who who's really specialize or do a lot of those deals, they've been around long enough where they just don't list the dogs. They don't have to. And so you start, my feeling is you start with them to see what they have in inventory. Make sense, Lauren? Absolutely. I agree. And I actually came upon a firm that only sells e-commerce businesses and the multiples were extraordinarily high. You know, the other thing, employees. Right now, I think employees are, if not the biggest, pretty close to the biggest risk for people who own small and mid-sized businesses. And I am pounding into the buyers who hire me that we have to carefully examine the history of the employment factor for a business. Where, what's it been like? How was it in the pandemic? And what's coming? Because if we don't do that, we can end up buying a business that the seller is getting rid of because he or she doesn't want to cope with what's happening in the employee realm. Well, okay. Go ahead. Well, Sorry, I stepped on you. That's, that's fine. No. Um, what I've said is that one of the biggest mistakes that sellers make is not having employee reviews available. In other words, a buyer doesn't want to buy in a vacuum and then be required to evaluate an employee based on a schedule of reviews. So the seller must not only document the prior review, but give a calendar of when the reviews are scheduled and the employees who are nervous anyway, when there's a new owner, will be more relaxed because there'll be a one-on-one -on -one relationship and they'll get the review at the right time. But again, buyers do not want to operate in vacuums. And this is something sellers do overlook. Okay, buyers, right now, pause, roll this tape back about 60 seconds and listen to that again. That's going to save your assets, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Ah, oh, Lauren, what are, you, what are you going to try to accomplish in, let's say, the real near future? Well, this is quite unusual. There are certain companies in my industry that do valuations. And they approach a business owner and say, let us value your company. If you are pleased with the valuation, list your business with us. We will sell it. And when we sell it, we'll give you credit or the valuation that you paid against the commission. It all sounds good, right? Well, here's what actually happens. The valuation says what the owner wants to hear, not what the owner needs to hear. So of course, the owner is pleased with the valuation that they've paid maybe thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 for, and they list their business. And they're thinking, okay, when it sells, I'll get this money back. Well, several years later, the company's still on the market. It hasn't sold, and they understand they've been taken advantage of. What I would like to do, I've come up with a program where any company has been defrauded, I'll use that word, uh, taken advantage of, that if they list with me, I will attempt to get some of that money back for them because I don't like what happened to them, and they certainly don't like 
what happened to them. So that's the near future goal. For those of you who are following me, you know I run a business called Partner On Call Network. But for 20 years, 1985 to 2005, you knew me as Business Valuation Network. And in that Business Valuation Network, guess what we did? Business valuations. And we did them for buyers, sellers, and banks. I had 98 referring offices throughout the United States and Canada, sending that valuation work to me and the people who worked for me. So we we worked in just about every niche out there. I have a file cabinet still, I keep it for old time sakes, of <laughs> these valuations or oh. evaluations that people paid, I'm talking tens of thousands of dollars for, uh, that were bullshit. <laughs> so, so thank you, Lauren, for pulling this up for us to think about. When you're trying to value companies, you, you need to talk to people who know what to doing. Don't listen to sales pitches. Get second opinions. This is huge. Okay, Warren, Lauren, how about some parting words for our audience? Well, as simple as it may sound, Ted, honesty is the best policy. I believe that total transparency up front will avoid anger and frustration down the road. So that's my advice to both sellers and to buyers. I don't know if anybody's counting, but Lauren has mentioned variations of that theme three or four times. There's a really good reason for it because we don't see that a lot on the playing field. So buck up folks, more honesty, mm -hmm. more transparency, because guess what? How you begin determines how you end. And if you start hiding the ball up front, um, expect the other side to reciprocate. This is never good. Lauren, how can people contact you? Uh, they can go to my website. It's B-O-T-L-I-N-E.com, botline.com. Botline, kind of like bottom line? Yeah, it's short. It's short for bottom line management. That's pretty cool. Okay, folks, I'm Ted Leverett, the original business buyer advocate with Partner on Call Network. You can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me on YouTube. Hey, you could go to Amazon and buy some of my how to buy business books. Mm -hmm. And you can find me at my website, partneroncall.com. Folks, be safe out there. Thank you, Ted. Okay, Lauren, it's been a pleasure. Same here. Hey, you. That's right, you. Have you been looking to buy an exciting and profitable business? Are you tired of searching, but only finding barriers that impede you from owning a wonderful business? Well, have we got some good news for you. You can find and buy the right business the right way. And you don't have to go it alone. For over 30 years, author and transaction advisor Ted Leverett, the original business buyer advocate, has been helping buyers worldwide achieve win-win done deals. Ted Leverett says, you can't buy it if you can't find it. You see, buying a business is all about search. Because if you can't find it, you can't buy it. It's about being best and first. First on the scene with sellers and being the seller's first choice. And top of mind for brokers and sellers. And most importantly, avoiding buyer competition. What about having to compete with other buyers? Well you have to outbid them, which is a good way to pay more than a business is worth. Searchers do better with a winning business buyer marketing plan, and that's where Ted Leverett comes in. He'll help you prepare a winning plan, and then he'll guide your actions so you can find and then buy the right business the right way. But searching is not enough. The reality is too many people buy the wrong business, or they buy the right business, but on the wrong terms. That's why, if you want to buy the right business the right way, it makes sense to have Ted Leverett, the original business buyer advocate, on your advisory team. And one of the best ways to know what the savviest searchers and buyers do is to read Ted Leverett's books, How to Prepare Yourself and Find the Right Business to Buy, and How to Buy the Right Business the Right Way. You can get them at his website, partneroncall.com. Don't chance it, right now. Go to partneroncall.com, get the books, 
and schedule a free and private telephone conversation with Ted Leverett. You can do better if you contact me and we build or improve your searcher marketing plan. You can learn more about searching by reading my book, How to Prepare Yourself and Find the Right Business to Buy. And my other book helps you achieve worthwhile deals, How to Buy the Right Business the Right Way. You will save time. You will save money. You will achieve better deals if you do what the savviest buyers do. I'm available to help you deploy the tactics and strategies from my books. You can get them on Amazon. So, I'm Ted Leverett, the original business buyer advocate with Partner On Call Network. Thanks for listening.